The Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory by Marilyn Fry. Essay number two, Sexism. The first philosophical project I undertook as a feminist was that of trying to say carefully and persuasively what sexism is and what it is for someone, some institution, or some act to be sexist. This project was pressed on me with considerable urgency because, like most women coming to a feminist perception of themselves in the world, I was seeing sexism everywhere and trying to make it perceptible to others. I would point out, complain, and criticize, but most frequently my friends and colleagues would not see what I would what I declared to be sexist, was sexist, or at all objectionable. As the critic, and as the in initiator of the topic, I was the one to whom the burden of proof fell. It was I who had to explain and convince. Teaching philosophy had already taught me that people cannot be persuaded of things they are not ready to be persuaded of. There are certain complexes of will and prior experience which will inevitably block persuasion, no matter the merits of the case presented. I knew that even if I could explain fully and clearly what I was saying when I called someone sexist, or something sexist, I would not necessarily be able to convince various others of the correctness of this claim. But what troubled me enormously was that I could not explain it in any way which satisfied me. It is this sort of moral and intellectual frustration which, in my case at least, always generated philosophy. The following was the product of my first attempt to state clearly and explicitly what sexism is. The term sexist is in its core and perhaps most fundamentally meaning is a term which characterizes anything, which, whatever, which creates, constitutes, promotes, or exploits any irrelevant or impertinent marking of the distinction between the sexes. When I composed this statement, I was thinking of the myriads of instances in which persons of the two sexes are treated differently or behave differently, but where nothing in, in the real differences between females and males justifies or explains the differences of treatment or behavior. I was thinking, for instance, of the tracking of boys in shop and girls in home ec, where one can see nothing about the boys or girls considered in themselves, which seems to connect essentially with the distinction between wrenches and egg beaters. I was thinking also of sex discrimination in employment, cases where someone otherwise apparently qualified for the job is not hired because she is a woman. But when I tried to put this definition of sexist in use, it did not stand the test. Consider this case. If a company is hiring a supervisor who will supervise a group of male workers who have always worked for male supervisors, it can scarcely be denied that the sex of a candidate for the job is relevant to the candidate's prospect of moving smoothly and successfully into an effective working relationship with the supervisees, though the point is usually exaggerated by those looking for excuses not to hire women. Relevance is an intrasystemic intr thing. The patterns of behavior, attitude, and custom within which a process goes or determines what is relevant to what in matters of describing, predicting, or evaluating. In the end, in the case at hand, the workers' attitudes and the surrounding customs of the culture make a difference to how they interact with their supervisors and, in particular, make the sex of the supervisor a relevant factor in predicting how things will work out. So then, if the company hires a man, in preference to a more experienced and knowledgeable um, woman, can we explain our objection to that decision by saying it involved distinguishing on the basis of sex when sex is irrelevant to the ability to do the job? No, sex is relevant here. So, what did I mean to say about sexes? I was thinking that in the case of a candidate for a supervisory job, the reproductive capabilities of the candidate has nothing to do with the person's knowing what needs to be done, and being able to do it properly, timed, clear, and correct directions. What I was picturing was a situation purified of all sexist perception and reaction, but, of course, if the whole context were not sexist, sex would not be an issue in such a job situation. Indeed, it might go entirely unnoticed. It is precisely the fact that the sex of the candidate is relevant that is the salient symptom of the sexism of the, of the situation. I had failed in the first essay fully to grasp or understand what the focus of sexism is primarily in the system or framework, not in the particular act. It is not accurate to say that what is going on in cases of sexism is that distinctions are made on the basis of sex when sex is irrelevant. What is wrong in the cases of sexism is the first place, in the first place, that sex is relevant. 
and then that the making of distinctions on the basis of sex reinforces the pattern which makes it relevant. In sexist cultural slash economic systems, sex is always relevant. To understand what sexism is, then, we have to step back and take a larger view. Sex identification intrudes into every moment of our lives and discourse, no matter what the supposedly primary focus or topic at the moment. Elaborate, systemic, ubiquitous, and redundant marking of a distinction between the two sexes of humans and most animals is customary and obligatory. One never can ignore it. Examples of sex marking behavior patterns abound. A couple enters a restaurant. The head, wait the head waiter or hostess addresses, addresses the man and does not address the woman. The physician addresses the man by surname and honorific, Mr. Baxter, or slash Reverend Jones, and addresses the woman by a given name, Nancy or Gloria. You congratulate your friend, a hug, a slap on the back, shaking hands, kissing. One of the things which determines which of these you do is your friend's sex. In everything one does, one has two complete repertoires of behavior, one for interaction with women and one for interaction with men. Greeting, storyteller, storytelling, order giving, or order receiving, negotiating, gesturing, differences, or dominance, encouraging, challenging, asking for information. One does all of these things differently depending upon whether the, rela the relevant others are male or female. That this is so has been confirmed in sociologi sociological and sociolinguistic research, but it is just as easily confirmed in, our, in one's own experience. To discover the difference in how you greet a woman and how you greet a man, for instance, just observe yourself paying attention to the following sorts of things. Frequency and duration of eye contact. Frequency and type of touch. Tone and pitch of voice. Physical distance maintained between bodies. How and whether you smile. Use a slang word or a swear word. Whether your body dips into a shadowy curtsy or a bow. That I have two repertoires for handling introductions to people was vividly confirmed for me when a student introduced me to his friend, Pat, and I really could not tell what sex Pat was. For a moment, I stopped cold, completely incapable of action. I felt myself helplessly caught between two paths, the one I would take if Pat was female and the one I would take if Pat were male. Of course, the paralysis does not last. One is rescued by one's ingenuity and goodwill. One can invent a way of to behave as one says, how do you do to a human being? But the habitual way we are not for ways are not for humans. They are the one way for women and another way for men. Interlaced through all of our behavior is one speaking, our linguistic behavior. Third person singular pronouns mark the sex of the reference. The same is true for a range of the nouns we use to refer to people, guy, boy, lady, salesman, etc., and all the terms which covertly indicate the sex of the referent, like pilot, nurse, and the majority of given proper names, Bob, Gwen. In speaking, one constantly makes marks the sex of those that one speaks about. The frequency with which our behavior marks the sexes of those we interact with cannot be exaggerated. The phenomenon is absolutely pervasive and deeply entrenched in all the patterns of behavior which are habitual, customary, acceptable, tolerable, and intelligible. One can invent ways of behaving in one situation or another which are not sex marking, which do not have do not vary with the sexes of the person involved, but in one where to succeed in removing sex marking from one's behavior altogether, one's behavior would be so odd as to precipitate immediate crisis of intelligibly and strenuously moral, religious, and aesthetic objections from others. Everything one did would seem strange. And this is a matter of no small amount. We are a gregarious species. Our lives depend on our ability to interact with others in relations of work and exchange and of sympathy. What one cannot do without seeming excessively odd or unintelligible, one cannot do without severe disturbance to the pattern of interactions upon which one's life depends. Sex marking behavior is not optional. It is an obligatory, it is as obligatory as it is pervasive. The closely connect, 
Closely connected with habitual and obligatory sex marking is a constant and urgent need to know or to be able to guess the sex of every single person with whom one has the lightest or most remote contact or interaction. If we are going to mark people's sexes in every situation, then we have to know their sexes. I needed to know whether Pat was endowed with a clitoris or a penis prior to making the first step in getting acquainted. If I am writing a book review, the use of the personal pronouns to refer to the author creates the need to know whether that person's reproductive cells are the sort which produce ova or the sort which produce sperm. I cannot ask the time of day without first knowing or presuming I know my informant's potential role in reproduction. We are socially and communicatively helpless if we do not know the sex of everybody we have anything to do with, or for members of such species as ours, such helplessness can be life-threatening. Our habitual behavior patterns make knowing, make knowledge of each person's sex both pervasively pertinent and of the first importance. Furthermore, the importance and urgency of having such knowledge is intensified by another sort of factor which I think most people rarely notice because they do usually know the sexes of others. In a culture in which one is deemed sinful, sick, or disgusting, at least, if one is not heterosexual, it is important to keep track of one's sexual feelings and of the sexes of those who inspire them. If one is permitted sexual expression or gratification, or even mere feeling, with persons of one sex but not of the other, one has to know what sex each person is before one can allow one's heart to beat or one's blood to flow in the erotic enjoyment of that person. person. <clears throat> Much of our ordinary and apparently non-sexual interaction and communication involves elements of sexual or erotic message, and these are rigidly regulated by, body ta by sex taboos, including the taboo of homosexuality. The adjustments or maladjustments of these messages to the sex of the person in question can have a wonderful or disastrous consequence. The thought that one might mis misapprehend the sex of another conjures nothing less than the holy dread of unwittingly of unwitting violation of powerful taboo thus all the tension connected with the sexual taboo taboo and repression intensifies the urgency of being acceptable and intelligible and our need to know everyone's sex carries much of the weight of an acute and emotionally fraught survival need The pressure on each of us to guess or determine the sex of everybody else both generates and is exhibited in the great pressure on each of us to inform everybody all the time of our sex. For if you strip humans of most of their cultural trappings, it is not always that easy to tell without close inspection which are female, which are male. The tangible and visible physical differences between the sexes are not particularly sharp or numerous. Individual variations along the physical dimension we think of as associated with maleness and femaleness are great, and the differences between the sexes could easily be obscured by bodily decorations, hair removal, and the like. One of the shocks when one does mistake someone's sex is the discovery of how easily one can be misled. We could not ensure that we could identify people by their sex virtually any time and anywhere under the conditions if they did not announce themselves, did not tell us in one way or another. We do not know, in fact, sorry, we do not, in fact, announce our sexes, quote unquote, in one way or another. We announce them in a thousand ways. We deck ourselves from head to toe with garments and decorations with serve like badges and buttons to announce our sexes. For every type of occasion, there is a distinct clothing, gear and accessories, hairdos and cosmetics and scents labeled as, quote unquote, ladies or, quote unquote, men's and labeling us as female or male. And most of the time, most of us choose, use, wear, or bear the paraphernalia associated with our sex. It goes below the skin as well. There are different styles of gait, gesture, posture, speech, humor, taste, or even the perception, or even of perception, interest, and attention that we learn as we grow to be women or to be men and that label and announce us as men or women. It begins early in life, even infants in arms. Um, are color-coded. That we wear and bear signs of our sexes and that this is compulsory is made clearest in the relatively rare cases when we do not do so or not enough. Responses ranging from critical to indignant to hostile meet mothers whose small children are not immediately sex-identifiable and hippies used to accost 
used to be accosted on the street by otherwise reserved and polite people with criticism and accusation when their clothing and style gave off mixed and contradictory sex announcements. Anyone in any kind of job placement service and any kind of and any success manual will tell you that you cannot expect to get or keep a job if your clothing or personal style is ambiguous in its announcement of your sex. We don't go to a job interview wearing the other sex's shoes and socks. The buzz on this last example indicates another source of pressure to inform each other of our sexes, namely, once again, the requirement that one by one, that one be and appear heterosexual. Queerly enough, one appears heterosexual by informing people of one's sex very emphatically and very ambiguously, and one does this by heaping into one's behavior and upon one's body ever more and more conclusive sex indicators. For homosexuals and lesbians who wish to pass as heterosexual, it is these indicators that provide most of the camouflage for those who wish to avoid being presumed heterosexual. The trick is to deliberately cultivate ambiguous sex indicators in clothes, behavior, and style. In a culture in which homosexuality and lesbianism are violently and almost universally forbidden, and heterosexuality is announced by announcing one's sex, it always behooves one to announce one's sex. The information as to what sex one is is always wanted, and supplying it is always appropriate to one's own and others' most constant and pervasive interests, interest in being and remaining viable in the available human community. The intense demand for making and for asserting that sex, what sex each person is, adds up to a strenuous requirement that there be two distinct and sharply dimorphic sexes, but in reality there are not. There are people who fit on a biological spectrum between two not so sharply defined poles. In about 5% of live births, possibly more, the babies are in some degree or way not perfect examples of male or female. There are individuals with chromosomal patterns other than XX or XY, and individuals whose external genitalia at birth exhibit some degree of ambiguity. There are people who are chromosomally quote-unquote normal, who are at the far ends of the normal spectrum of secondary sex characteristics, height, weight, musculature, hairiness, body density, distribution of fat, breast size, etc., whose overall appearance fits the norm of people whose chromosomal sex is the opposite of theirs. These variations notwithstanding, persons, mainly men of course, with the power to do so, actually construct a world in which men are men and women are women, and there is nothing in between and nothing ambiguous. They do it by chemically and or surgically altering people whose bodies are indeterminate or ambiguous with respect to sex. Newborns with quote-unquote imperfectly formed genitals are immediately quote-unquote corrected by chemical or surgical means. Children and adolescent given hormone quote-unquote therapies if their bodies seem to not be developing according to what physicians and others declare to be the norm for what has been declared to be that individual's sex. Persons with authority recommend and supply cosmetic and surgical regimens, diets, exercises, and all manner of clothing to revise or disguise the too hairy lip, the too large breast, the too slender shoulder, or the too large feet, the too great or too slight stature. Individuals whose bodies do not fit the picture of what of exactly two sharply dimorphic sexes are often enough quite willing to be altered or veiled for the obvious reason that the world punishes them severely for their failures to be the quote-unquote facts which would verify the doctrine of two sexes. The demand that the world be a world in which there are exactly two sexes is inexorable, and we are all compelled to answer it emphatically, unconditionally, rep repetitiously, and unambiguously. Even being physically quote-unquote normal for one's sex is not enough. One must be female or male actively. Again, the costumes and performances. Pressed to acting feminine or masculine, one colludes, collude, play along, with the doctors and counselors in the creation of a world in which apparent dimorphism of the sexes is so extreme that one can only think that there is a great gulf between female and male and that there are two essentially fundamentally, fundamentally and naturally utterly different. One helps to create a world in which it seems to us that we could never mistake a woman for a man or a man for a woman. We never need worry.
Along with all those making, marking, and announcing the sex distinction goes a strong and visceral feeling or attitude to the effect that sex distinction is most important thing in the world. That it would be the end of the world if it were not maintained clear, sharp, and rigid. That a sex dualism which is rooted in the nature of the beast is so absolutely crucial and fundamental to all aspects of life, human society, and human economy. Where feminism is perceived as, as a project of blurring this distinction, anti-feminist rhetoric is vivid with the dread that the world will end if the feminists have their way. Some feminists' insistence that the feminist goal is not a quote-unquote unisex society is defensive in a way that suggests they too believe that culture or civilization could not survive blurring the distinction. I think that one of those sources of the prevalence and the profundity of this conviction and the dread is our immersion in the very behavior patterns I have been discussing. It is a general and obvious principle to inform of information theory that when it is very, very important that certain information be conveyed, the suitable strategy is redundancy. If a message must get through, one sends it repeatedly and by any means or media as one has at one's command. On the other hand, as a receiver of information, if one receives the small, the same information over and over, conveyed by every medium one knows, another message comes through as well and, and implicitly. The message that this information is very, very important. The enormous frequency with which information about people's sexes is conveyed conveys implicitly the message that this topic is enormously important. I suspect that this is the single topic on which we most frequently receive information from others throughout our entire lives. If I am right, it would go part way to explaining why we end up with an almost irresistible impression, unarticulated, that the matter of people's sexes is the most important and most fundamental topic in the world. We exchange sex identification information along with the implicit message that it is very important in a variety of circumstances in which there are really is no concrete or explanate or experientially obvious point in having the information. There are reasons, as this discussion has shown, why you should want to know whether the person filling your water glass or your tooth is male or female, and why that person wants to know what you are. But those reasons are woven invisibly into the fabric of social structure, and they do not have to do with the same bare mechanisms of things being filed. Furthermore, the same culture which drives us to this constant information exchange also simultaneously enforces a strong blanket rule requiring that the simplest and most nearly definitive physical manifestations of sex, sex differences, be hidden from view in all but the most private and intimate circumstances. The double message of sex distinction and its preeminent importance is conveyed, in fact, in part by devices which systemically and deliberately cover up and hide from view the physical things which do to a fair extent, distinguish the two sexes of humans. The messages are overwhelmingly dissociated from the concrete facts that they are supposed, supposedly pertain to, and from mattress, matrices of concrete and sensible reason and consequences. Small children's minds must be hopelessly boggled by this, we know our own sex and learn to think it a matter of first importance that one is a girl or a boy so early that we do not remember not knowing. Long before physical differences in our young bodies could make more than the most trivial practical differences. A friend of mine whose appearance and style have a little bit about them that is gender ambiguous walked past a mother and a child and heard the child asked the mother is she a man or a woman the struggle to define one to define some connection between social behavior and the physical sex and the high propriety of it all seems painfully obvious here if one is made to feel that a thing is of prime importance but common sensory experience does not connect it with things of obvious concrete and practical importance then there is a mystery and with that a strong tendency <clears throat> to construct of mystical and metaphysical conceptions of its importance. It is important, but not of mundane importance. It must be of transcendent importance. All the more of it is very important. This matter of our sexes must be very profound indeed, if it must, on pain of shame and ostracism, be covered up 
and must, on pain of shame and ostracism, be boldly advertised by every means and medium one can devise. There is one more point about redundancy that is worth making here. If there is one thing more effective in making one believe a thing than receiving the message repetitively, it is rehearsing it repetitively. Advertisers, preachers, teachers, all of us in the brainwashing professions make use of this apparently physical fact of human physiology or psychology routinely. The redundancy of sex marking and sex announcing serves not only to make the topic seem transcendently important, but to make the sex duality it advertises seem transcendently and unquestionably true. It is quite a spectacle, really, once one sees it. These humans so devoted to dressing up and acting out and quote-unquote fixing one another so everyone lives up to and lives out the theory that there are only two sharply distinct sexes and never the twain shall overlap or be confused or conflated. These hominids constantly and with remarkable lack of embarrassment marking the distinction between the two sexes as though their lives depended on it. It is wonderful that homosexuals and lesbians are mocked and judged for quote-unquote playing butch femme roles and for dressing in quote-unquote butch femme drag for nobody goes about it in public view as thoroughly decked out in the butch femme drag as respectable heterosexuals when they are dressed up to go out in the evening or to go to church or to go to the office heterosexual critics of queer quote-unquote role play ought to look at themselves in the mirror on their way out for the night on the town and see who's in drag the answer is everybody is Perhaps the main difference between heterosexuals and queers is that when queers go forth in drag, they know they are engaged in theater. They are playing, and they know that they are playing. Heterosexuals usually are taking it all perfectly seriously, thinking that they are in the real world, thinking they are the real world. Of course, in a way, they are the real world. All this bizarre behavior has a function in the construction of the real world. Sex marking and sex announcing are equally compulsory for males and females, but that is as far as the equality goes in this matter. The meaning and import of this behavior is profoundly different for women and for men. This is like a page from a book. Imagine a colony of humans established a civilization hundreds of years ago on a distant planet. It has evolved as civilizations will. Its language is descendant of English. The language has personal pronouns marking the child-adult distinction, and its adult personal pronouns mark the distinction between straight and curly pubic hair. At puberty, each person assumes distinguishing clothing, styles, and manners so others can tell what type she is or he is without the closer scrutiny which would generally be considered indecent. People with straight pubic hair adopt a style which is modest and self-effacing and clothes which are fragile and confining. People with curly pubic hair will adopt a style which is expansive and prepossessing and clothes which are sturdy and comfortable. People whose pubic hair is neither clearly straight nor clearly curly alter their hair chemically in order to be clearly one or the other. Since those with curly pubic hair have higher status and economic advantages, those with ambiguous pubic hair are told to make it straight, for life will be easier for a low status person whose category might be doubted than for a high status person whose category might be doubted. It is taboo to eat or drink in the same room with any person of the same pubic hair type as oneself. Compulsory heterogormondism, it is called by social critics, though most people would think is just natural human desire to eat with one's pubic hair opposite. A logical consequence of this habit, or taboo, is the limitation to dining one only singly or in pairs, a taboo against banquetism or, as the slang expression goes, against the group gulp. So the end of that page. Whatever features an individual male person has, which tend to his social and economic disadvantage, his age, race, class, height, etc., one feature which never tends to his disadvantage in the society at large is his maleness. The case for females in the mirror image is the mirror image of that. Whatever features individualized female persons has, which tend to her social and economic advantage, her age, race, etc., are features which always tend to her disadvantage is her femaleness. Therefore, 
When a male sex category is the thing about him that gets first and most repeated notice, the thing about him that is being framed and emphasized and given primary primacy is a feature which is general, which is in general an asset to him. When a female sex category is the thing about her that gets first and most repeatedly noticed, the thing about her that is being framed and emphasized and given primacy is a feature which is in general a liability to her. Manifestations of this divergence in the meaning and, cons- and consequence consequences of sex announcements can be very concrete. Walking down the street in the evening in a town or city exposes one to some risk of assault. For males, the risk is less. For females, the risk is greater. If one announces oneself male, one is presumed by potential assailants to be more rather than less likely to defend oneself or to be able to evade the assault. And if the male announcement is strong and unambiguous, to be a non-candidate for sexual assault. If one announces oneself female, one is presumed by potential assailants to be less rather than more likely to defend oneself or to evade the assault. And if the female announcement is strong and unambiguous, to be the prime candidate for sexual assault. Both the man and the woman, quote unquote, announce their sex through style of gait, clothing, hairstyle, etc. But they are not equally or identically affected by announcing their sex. The male's announcement tends towards his protection or safety, and the female's announcement tends towards her victimization. It could not be more immediate or concrete. The meaning of the sex identification could not be more different. The sex marking behavior repertoires are such that in the behavior of almost all people of both sexes addressing or responding to males, especially within their own culture slash race, generally is done in a manner which suggests basic respect, while addressing or responding to females is done in a manner that suggests females' inferiority, condescending tones, presumptions of ignorance, overfamiliarity, sexual aggression, etc. So, when one approaches an ordinary, well-socialized person in such cultures, if one is male, one's own behavioral announcement of maleness tends to evoke supportive and beneficial response, and if one is female, one's behavior announcement of femaleness tends to evoke degrading and detrimental response. The details of the sex announcing behavior also contrib- contribute to the reduction of women and the elevation of men. The case is most obvious in the matter of clothing. As feminists have been saying for 200 years or so, ladies' clothing is generally restrictive, binding, burdening, and frail. It threatens to fall apart and or to uncover something that is supposed to be covered if you bend, reach, kick, punch, or run. It typically does not protect effectively against hazards in the environment, not per- nor permit the wearer to protect herself against the hazards of the human environment. Men's clothing is generally the opposite of all of this. Sturdy, suitable, protective, permitting movement and locomotion. The details of fem- sorry, the details of feminine manners and the postures also serve to bind and restrict. To be feminine is to take up little space, to defer to others, to be silent or affirming of others. It is not necessary here to survey all of this, for it has been done many times and in illuminating detail in feminist writings. My point here is that though both men and women must behave in sex announcing ways the behavior which announces femaleness is in itself both physically and socially binding and limiting as a behavior which announces which announcing maleness is not the sex correlated variations in our behavior tend systemically to the benefit of males and the detriment of females The male announcing his sex, his sex-identifying behavior in dress, is both announcing and acting out his membership in a dominant caste, dominant within his subculture, and to be fair, and to a fair extent across subcultures as well. The female announcing her sex is both announcing and acting on her membership in the subordinate category, category, subordinate caste. She is obliged to inform others constantly and in every sort of situation that she is to be treated as inferior without authority assaultable she cannot move or speak within the casual within the usual cultural norms without engaging in self-deprecation the male cannot move or speak without engaging in self-aggrandizement constant sex identification both defines and maintains the caste boundary without which there could not be a dominance subordination structure
The forces which make us mark and announce sexes are among the forces which constitute the oppression of women, and they are central and essential to the maintenance of that system. Oppression is a system of interlaced, of interrelated barriers and forces which reduce, immobilize, and mold people who belong to a certain group and affect their subordination to another group, individually to individuals of the group and as a group to that group. Such a system could not exist were not the groups, the categories of persons, well-defined. Logically, it presupposes that there are two distinct categories. Practically, they must not they must be not only distinct, but relatively easily identifiable. The barriers and forces could not be suitably located and applied if there were often much doubt as to which individuals were to be contained and reduced, which were to be dominated. It is extremely costly to subordinate a large group of people simply by applications of material force, as is indicated by the cost of maximum security prisons and of military s- suppression of nationalist movements. For subordination to be permanent and cost-effective, it is necessary to create conditions such as the subordinated group acquiesces to some extent to the subordination. Probably one of the most efficient ways to secure acquiescence is to convince the people that their subordination is inevitable. The mechanism by which the subordinate and dominant categories are defined can contribute to popular belief in the inevitability of the dominant slash subordination structure. For efficient subordination, what's wanted is that the structure not appear to be a cultural artifact kept in place by human decisions or custom, but that it appear to be natural. That it appear to be a quite direct consequence of the facts about the beasts which are beyond the scope of human manipulation or revision. It must seem natural that individuals of the one category are dominated by individuals of the other, and that as groups, the one dominates the other. To make this seem natural, it will help if it seems to all concerned that members of the two groups are very different from one another, and this appearance is enhanced if it can be made to appear that that within each group, the members are very like one another. In other words, the appearance of neutralness of the dominance of men and the subordination of women is supported by anything which supports the appearance that men are very like other men and very unlike women, and that women are very like other women and very unlike men. All behavior which encourages the appearance of humans are biologically sharply sharply sextamorphic, encourages the acquiescence of women, and to the extent it needs to be encouraged of men in women's subordination. That we are trained to behave so differently as women and as men, and to behave so differently towards women and towards men, itself contributes mightily to the appearance of sex of extreme natural dimorphism but also the ways we act as women and as men and the ways we act towards women and towards men mold our bodies and our minds to the shapes of subordination and dominance we do become what we practice being Throughout this essay, I have seemed to beg the question at hand. Should I not be trying to prove that there are few and insignificant differences between females and males if that is what I believe, rather than assuming it? What I have been doing is offering observations which suggest that if one thinks that there are biologically deep differences between women and men which cause and justify divisions of labor and responsibility, such as we see in the modern patriarchal family and male-dominated workplace, one may not have arrived at this belief because of the direct experience of unmolested physical evidence, but because our customs serve to construct that appearance. And I suggest that these customs are artifacts of culture which exist to support a morally and scientifically in, insupportable system of dominance and insubordination. But also, in the end, I do not want to claim simply that there are not si- socially significant, biologically grounded differences between human females and males. Things are much more complex than that. Enculturation and socialization are, I think, misunderstood if one pictures them as a process which applies layers of cultural gloss over a bio biological substratum it is with the picture is with that picture in mind that one asks whether this or that aspect of behavior is due to quote-unquote nature or quote-unquote nurture 
One means, does it emanate from the biological substratum, or does it come from some layer of the shellac? A variant of this wrong picture is the picture according to which enculturation and socialization in something mental or psychological, as opposed to something physiological or biological. Then one can think of attitudes and habits of perception, for instance, as quote-unquote learned versus quote-unquote biologically determined. And again, one can ask such things as whether men's aggressiveness is learned or biologically determined, and if the former is asserted, one can, thinks of terms in change- one can think in terms of changing them while the latter is asserted, and one must give up all thought of reform. My observations and experience suggest another way of looking at this. I see enormous social pressure on all of us to act feminine or act masculine, and not both. So I am inclined to think that we were that if we were to break the habits of of culture which generate that pressure, people would not act particularly masculine or feminine. In fact, oh sorry, <clears throat> the fact that there are such penalties threatened for deviation from these patterns strongly suggests that the pattern would not be there but for the threats. This leads, I think, to a skeptical conclusion. We do not know whether human behavior patterns would be dimorphic along the lines of chromosomal sex if we were not threatened and bullied, nor do we know if we assume that we would be dimorphous what they would be, that is, what constellations of traits and tendencies would fall out along the genetic line. And these questions are odd anyway, for there is no question of humans growing up without culture, so we don't know what other cultural variables we might imagine to be at work in a culture in which the familiar training to masculinity and femininity were not going on. On the other hand, as one goes about in the world, and in particular, as one tries out strategies meant to alter the behaviors which constitute and support male dominance, one often has extreme, extremely convincing experiences of that inflexibility of people in this respect, or, or, sorry, of a resistance to change which seems to run much, much deeper than willingness or willfulness in the face of arguments and evidence. As feminist activists, many of us have felt this most particularly in the case of men, and it is sometimes... And it has sometimes seemed that the relatively, the relative flexibility and, and adaptability of women and the relative rigidity of men are so widespread within each group, respectively, and so often and convincingly encountered that they must be biologically given. And one watches men and women on the streets and their bodies seem so different, one hardly can avoid thinking there are vast and profound differences between women and men without giving up the hard-won confidence is in one's power of perception. The first remedy here is to lift one's eyes from a single culture, class, or race. If the bodies of Asian women set them apart so sharply from Asian men, see how different they are also from black women. If white men all look alike and very different from white women, it helps to note that black men don't look like white men. The second remedy is to think about the subjective experiences we have of our habits. If one habitually twists sorry if one habitually twists a lock of one's hair whenever one is reading and has tried to break this habit one knows how quote unquote bodily it is but that does not convince one it is genetically determined people who drive to work every day often take the same route every day and if they mean to take another route on the day in order to do an errand on the way they may find themselves at work conveyed along the habitual route without having revised the decision to do the errand. The habit of taking that course is mapped into one's body. It is not a matter of a decision, a mental event, that is re repeated each day upon a daily rejudgment of the reasonableness of the course. It is also not genetic. We are animals. Learning is physical, bodily. There is not a separate, non-material, quote-unquote, control room where socialization, enculturation, and habit forming take place where, since it is non-material, change is independent of bodies and easier than in bodies. Socialization molds our bodies. Enculturation forms our skeleton, our musculature, our central nervous system. By the time we are gendered adults, masculinity and femininity are, quote-unquote, biological. They are structural and material features of our, how our bodies are. 
My experience suggests that they are changeable just as one would expect bodies to be slowly through constant practice and deliberate regimens designed to remap and rebuild nerve and tissue. This is how many of us have changed when we chose to change from quote unquote women as culturally defined to quote unquote women as we define ourselves. Both the sources of the changes and the resistance to them are bodily are among the possibilities of our animal nature whatever they those may be but now quote unquote biological does not mean quote unquote genetically determined or quote unquote inevitable it just means quote unquote of the animal It is no accident that feminism has often focused on our bodies. Rape, battering, reproductive self-determination, health, nutrition, self-defense, athletics, financial independence, control of the means of feeding and sheltering ourselves. And it is no accident that with varying degrees of consciousness, of conscious intent, feminists have tried to create separate places for women, where women could exist somewhat sheltered from the prevailing winds of patriarchal culture and try to stand up straight for once. One needs, one needs space to practice an erect posture. One cannot just will it to happen. To retrain one bod one's body, one needs physical freedom from what are, in the, la in the last analysis, physical forces misshaping it to the contours of the subordinate. The cultural and economic structures which create and enforce elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing behavior, that is, create gender as we know it, mold us as dominators and subordinates and subordinates. <clears throat> I do not say quote unquote mold our minds or quote unquote mold our personalities. They construct two classes of animals, the masculine and the feminine, where another constellation of forces might have constructed three or five categories and not necessarily hierarchically related. Or such a spectrum of sorts that we would not experience them as quote-unquote sorts at all the term sexist characterizes cultural and economic structures which create and enforce the elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing announcing which divide the species along lines of sex into dominators and subordinates individual acts and practices are sexist which reinforce and support those structures either as culture or as shapes taken on by the enculturated animals Resistance to sexism is that which undermines those structures by social and political action and by projects of reconstruction and revision of ourselves. <clears throat>